It's a, a pleasure to welcome everybody back. Uh, we missed Dr. Mark in the last number of weeks, and uh, the true matter has been um, since I think the first week of the lockdown, since we've had great rabbinic series. Mark was doing the, a series on, on the Nitziv, and I think the eighth lecture on the Nitziv was the first week, like North America went into lockdown. And then we uh, switched, we're on, on, a, on a different platform. I hadn't heard of Zoom yet. We're using Adobe Acrobat. It was a whole different world back then. And then uh, right after the Nitziv, we switched. They gave us talks on Kitniot on Pesach. And then he gave a series, of course, on the Mir Yeshiva. And then we started with his book. And for the last 53 weeks, pretty much, with uh, except for Yontif and the week here, uh, he's been talking about his book. And now we're back to our series that began back in 2007. I believe we began our series of great rabbinic thinkers. There are 195 past talks you can listen to online. As I mentioned in the email, everybody from uh, the right, the left, the center, upside down, here and there, we get the whole world of, um, and that's one of the things we like very much about Dr. Mark is his breath. And uh, he tells it like it is from all perspectives. I, I always I joke around when he gave his, I, it's not even a joke. When he gave his, his first talk on the Satmar Rebbe, I almost, almost uh, wanted to be a Satmar Hasid, you know, by, by the end of the second talk, I wanted to go far away from summer, but, you know, presents the, it's the, the full range, you know, the uh, everything. So really, it's a pleasure to talk, well, welcome you back. And uh, we're going to do Shaul Lieberman, as everybody knows, I'm sure you all know that. And before we start, I want to thank, of course, our sponsors for this evening. I uh, want to thank them for their ongoing ongoing support and coming to so many classes and really thank Estella Berman, Lily Feather, and Sarah Avihar who are sponsoring tonight's class in memory of their mother, Leah Batchaim Leib. Should, the Neshama should have an Aliyah. The Yorzeit, I think, was a few weeks ago, but they wanted to wait to Dr. Shapiro's class to Dafka sponsor this class, and they should have long life and good memories, and we should all have happy occasions to celebrate. Okay, Dr. Mark, uh, Vaka Shatz, all yours. Okay, uh, well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome back to those who've uh, been with us for so long. Uh, welcome to those who, uh, this is the first time you're with us. Uh, the classes the rabbi mentioned, uh, you can all listen to them on Torah in Motion on the website. And since the kidney oat class and uh, the whole series, you can also find them on YouTube and speed them up if you want. And for those who are new, the way I go is about uh, 50 minutes, and then uh, I'll get to the questions. Um, I always start by uh, talking about things, questions and comments that came in during the week from previous class, but I'm not going to do that now because we're starting a new, a fresh with a new series, although I do have to say that I, people did send me things. and at the So this week at the end, maybe I'll end five minutes early, 50. 50 minutes after, because a few interesting comments still, it is a continuing, it's a, it's a, we're 14 years continuing. So I will get back a couple interesting things, including one thing relevant to the journey I went on uh, during um, the two week break we had here. So I'll get to that at the end. But without any further ado, let me begin. As uh, Rabbi Kelman said, we're focusing on uh, Shaw Lieberman. Oh, one more thing. I'm from Minnesota, <laughs> born in Minnesota. So there you go. St. Cloud, Minnesota. Um, me and Bob Dylan. Uh, okay, so um, the good thing about Torah in Motion here is that it's not like I'm saying, well, I'm going to do three classes on Shaw Lieberman or five classes. I don't know how many classes, just like I didn't know that it would take 53 classes. It won't take 53 to do a Shaw Lieberman, but uh, I'm not sure how many, and that's what's great. We'll just keep going till we cover it, and when we have covered it, We'll be able to say that this is the most complete treatment of this uh, very interesting, great figure, uh, rabbi, professor, not doctor, as we'll see. He never had a doctorate, although he's often called uh, Dr. Uh, Shaul Lieberman. Now, this is part of the series of great rabbinic thinkers we call it Gedolim. And it was Rabbi Kelman, I was going to do someone else, and Rabbi Kelman said, uh, do Shaul Lieberman. So even before we get into his fascinating biography, which is going to take us from the great yeshivas in Europe to uh, the land of Israel, Eretz Yisrael, pre-state, uh, then to America, and uh, really the sociology of the American Jewish community, the battles between orthodoxy and conservative Judaism, as they were uh, creating really a separate movement, the conservative movement, uh, uh, we're going to see lots of great things, meet all sorts of interesting people along the way. Uh, but um, 
it was Rabbi Kelman who asked me to do this. And uh, the, I think the first thing to, uh, and I'm very happy he did, because I, I wrote a little book, which I'll show you later on, Shaul Lieberman, and, and uh, it gave me a chance to explore some of these matters uh, in more detail. But before even doing that, before even beginning with the biography and then uh, his accomplishments, all the things we're going to deal with, you know, I think we need to raise the question. These have been classes on Godot Yisrael, great rabbinic figures. Uh, is Shaul Lieberman? Let me actually, I should uh, show you a picture here of, um, um, let me get uh, a picture up on my screen here. Uh, hold on a second, why don't I have a screen here? Um, hmm. Where's my screen here? Everything moved on my thing here, but uh, ah, here it is. Okay, so um, two pictures of Shaul Lieberman. Here's one, it'll be coming up in a second, as a youth. I don't know how old he is, 18, 19 years old, uh, someone who knew Shas backwards and forwards at the young age. Here's a, a later picture of Shaul Lieberman. Uh, it's a famous picture. Uh, it's actually cut off in this picture. He's speaking to Louis Finkelstein. Uh, but uh, in the um, in the seminary, I haven't been there in a long time, but uh, they have, I, I hope they didn't get rid of it, but uh, in the, they, well, they couldn't have, I, I guess, the atrium area there uh, uh, where they have events and graduations. So uh, I, I, if I, as I recall, it's Finkelstein and also uh, Rosenberg. Uh, what's his name again? Uh, Rosenthal, sorry. Shimshon Eliezer Rosenthal. I think they're in the picture. But can we justly include Lieberman among the Gadol Yisrael, the great rabbinic sages? Uh, because the sociological uh, points we're going to see. His students call him the Grosh. But, you know, we're in an Orthodox program here. Can he be called this? Now, First of all, we have to ask, we throw around this term gadol. What does it mean to be a gadol? Let's be realistic here. A gadol is, is not just one who knows a lot of Torah. There's a sociological component. We never have assumed that the rabbi who knows the most Torah is the gadol hador, the Torah leader of the generation. There's a, first of all, you need to be a, a tzaddik also. There's a, uh, you need to have this combination of righteousness, of Torah knowledge, and that doesn't mean that the rabbi who's the most righteous or the rabbi is the most learned or even the combination. There's a whole sociological element where um, the community settles on these individuals and there's other great rabbis. I've known some of them, great Torah scholars. They just never make it in for whatever reason. Uh, in the dis I'll, I'll give you an example just uh, from our own time. In the, the, the great dispute they had in the land of Israel in the Haredi community, the Litvisha community, the leader of the majority was Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman. And the leader of the, the minority, for those who've been with me, know I'm referring to, was this Rabbi Shmuel Auerbach. You can look them up. Uh, that group was called the Pelek. And they were maybe 10 or 15%, I think. And Rabbi Steinman was probably 80, 85%, 85%, if not 90%, leadership of the Lithuania Haredi world. No one to my knowledge, and I've spoken to people about this. And I'm talking about people who supported Rabbi Steinman ever thought that he was as great a Torah scholar as Shmuel Auerbach. In fact, Rabbi Steinman, he was a Torah scholar, he wrote commentaries in the Talmud, but he never was regarded as the level of Rabbi Auerbach, he never was regarded as the level of many others. And that never was regarded as a psul, as a lack to say that he shouldn't be the Torah leader because the fact that Rabbi Shmuel Auerbach might have had more Torah knowledge, from their standpoint, he didn't have the seichel to be the leader because of uh, what he stood for. So that's the first point to know, the term gadol. By the way, this is just a side point. If, if you look in the Gemara, you see this term gadol and you see gadol Yisrael. Let me show you one example of this in uh, the Talmud here, where it's, it's unclear what it means. It's talking about when... Um, when someone's, let's say, ill, or you have to violate Shabbos to save someone, it says that you don't do this. Here's the Talmud right here. These acts, that is to violate Shabbos to save someone, should not be performed by Gentiles or Samaritans, but they should be done by the greatest of the Jewish people. G'dol Yisrael. And they, they, this is in accordance with the Rambam's understanding of what this word means. That is, they're scholars who know how to act properly. That is, you don't give it to the children. You don't say that the women should know. You don't say anyone. It says the G'dol Yisrael. 
if, if, if someone's ill and you have to violate Shabbos, you give it to the, the Gedolim, according to the Rambam. That's what the Rambam says in uh, Hilchos Shabbos. If you look in uh, chapter uh, one, chapter two, verse uh, Halacha three, what does the Rambam say? Who should violate the Shabbos? Gedoli Yisrael v'chachmehem. That is, if, it, if you're allowed to violate Shabbos, you don't say this great rabbi, he's too pious, they should do, violate it. Incidentally, though, this isn't how everyone understands it. If you look, I'm looking in the Rambam Amir, he quotes in the, the notes here, the Tashbes, or of uh, Shimon Semach Doren, brings a proof from the Jerusalem Talmud that uh, when it says Gedoli in here, Gedoli Yisrael, it means uh, not the great rabbis, but adults, people over bar mitzvah, as opposed to uh, Katani, young people. And uh, the Kesef Mishnah also uh, understands it uh, that way. Let me give you another example, incidentally, that um, the term that we use, Godol Hador. If you ask people today, what does it mean, the Godol Hador, the great one of the generation? They'll say the Torah leader of the generation. Well, look at this passage here in Pesachim, 49b. What does it say? The sages taught, a person should always be willing to sell all he has in order to marry the daughter of a Torah scholar. Bat Tamid Chacham. If he can't find the daughter of a Torah scholar, lo bat tamid chacham, yisa bat ador. He should marry the daughter of one of the great people of the generation. And uh, the translation here, this is from the, the Steinzeltz English or the Koran, who are pious, although they're not Torah scholars. If you look at Rashi, Rashi on Pesachim, what does he translate? Gadol ador, anche masav sadikim. It means lay people who, are, uh, who do good things for the community. So this term, Godol Hador, Godol Yisrael, it's not a, it's not Talmudic, although we use it. I, I found, incidentally, if you look in, uh, oh, I didn't save it here, but in Wikipedia, there's a whole entry on Wikipedia about this um, expression, uh, Godol Yador. Um, okay, so now it gets back to Lieberman. My interest in Lieberman really dates from when I was asked to give the Saul Lieberman Memorial Lecture. Every year, the, um, the, the students of Lieberman, uh, who became, I guess, the traditionalist students, the, the Union of Traditional Judaism, they put on a Lieberman, they called it a Lieberman Lecture, something in honor, in memory of Lieberman. They didn't have to focus on Lieberman per se, but I was asked to do it, and I thought, well, uh, I'm not sure why they asked me and what they wanted me to speak about, but I had been interested, uh, never really investigated it, and Lieberman's attitude towards the attitude of the Orthodox world to Lieberman. And I figured that would be a very good uh, topic uh, to speak about. Um, I, I spent a lot of time preparing it. Uh, it then came, um, it appeared in this little volume, uh, which you can get on Amazon for, I think, six bucks. Or if you see me in person, I'll give it to you for free. Uh, because uh, the University of Scranton continues to keep it in print and uh, Hundreds of copies were sold, and I've given away lots as well. It's published by my the institute at my university, the Weinberg Chinesky Institute. But you can pick it up. It's all about the relationship of Lieberman uh, to the Orthodox, and uh, we're going to go through the book, and we're going to speak about what's in there, and and all sorts of other things. But that's how I became uh, interested in it, and I do regard Lieberman as a godol for reasons we'll see. Certainly, a great Torah scholar. Uh, and um, he's definitely uh, belongs among the people we speak about, although as we'll see, he's complicated. Uh, but uh, many of the rabbis uh, we've spoken about uh, are complicated. I do also have to say, and this is gonna be, this is what makes him so interesting from one standpoint is that he knew more than, than all of these Godoli, basically. When you go down the list, I'm not talking about the ones from 200 years ago, but in his time, it's almost impossible to find someone who knew as much as Shaul Lieberman. I'm not saying he was, uh, he had the eon, as we say, the analysis of Rabbi Soloveitchik. Uh, or, but in terms of just sheer breadth of knowledge, and I'm not just referring to Talmud and all of rabbinic literature, I'm talking about all the Greek stuff we'll speak about, the Latin literature. It is unbelievable that a mind could encompass what he encompassed. Um, and I'm going to read you something before we even read the biography. I'm going to I'll read you two m short memoirs of him that uh, really set the stage before we've been looking at Charles Lieberman. By the way, his dates are um, 1893 to 1983, 1898, sorry, to 1983. So his lifetime encompassed so much interesting, uh, so many interesting things. Uh, 
Before we begin with the biography, as we always do, I just want to read you two short passages to give you a sense, if you don't know who Shaul Lieberman is, who we're dealing with, what type of mind uh, we're dealing with. And um, it be once you understand this, it becomes much more difficult for, let's say, the great Roshi Yeshiva of New York to simply reject him because of his career choices, because they knew as well as anyone that Shaul Lieberman was a greater Torah scholar than them. Now that's not, doesn't look, you could be, you could be Acher, Alisha ben Avuya, and uh, you could be a great Torah scholar, but be out of the fold. But Lieberman, as a completely observant Jew, one who thought that by going to the seminary, as we'll see, he thought this was a pious action and he could influence him in a good way. And he, no one could doubt that he was completely observant, unlike Louis Ginsburg, who we'll speak about, unlike other great Torah scholars who taught at uh, the non-Orthodox institutions, Lieberman remained completely Torah observant. Does that mean he's Orthodox? We'll, we'll get into this term Orthodox. What does the term Orthodox even mean? It's an invented term in 19th century uh, Germany. If you live in Israel today, there's the concept the term doesn't even exist, orthodox. So uh, orthodox is an American sociological term. And uh, today they would say that you can't have an orthodox synagogue um, if you don't have a machitza. As we'll see, in the 1940s and 1950s, lots of orthodox synagogues didn't have machitzas. Uh, it didn't mean you weren't orthodox. Uh, orthodox means if you associate with certain communities. So uh, the term orthodox is not going to be so much important as Torah true. And we're going to get into all these things, uh, and terminology becomes important uh, as well. But I want to read you. I want to read you something first. By um, his name was Yisrael Moshe Tashma. Right before the class, I figured I should uh, show you a picture of him. He was, uh, he he was an unbelievable scholar. He, he only he only lived sixty eight years. What he accomplished, he he won the Bialik Prize. He won the um, the Israel Prize. His name, Tashma, I don't know what his original name was or what his father changed the name from. Uh, Tashma is a Talmudic expression, come in here. In the Zohar, they don't say come in here, they say Tachazi, come and see. And that's supposed to have uh, significance. But Professor Tashma, who was an expert in manuscripts in Talmud or a Dane rabbi, uh, he says it. He, he wrote, uh, his collected essays were published in four volumes called, here you see it, Knesset Mech Karim. Um, and in the volume, volume number four, um, he has in the back um, a memorial, a short memorial for Shaul Lieberman. He calls him Hagrash, a of Shaul Lieberman. And let me just briefly, quickly tell you the story that he tells to get a sense of what uh, we're dealing with here. He says that... Um, he was once at an event, he, he served as um, a rabbi in the Israeli army in the chaplaincy. And this was in 1961. He met Rabbi Gorin, who was the chief chaplain at some event. And Rabbi Gorin asked him a riddle. Don't need to give you the exact riddle. It has to do with the Jerusalem Talmud. And Rabbi Gorin says, he hasn't found anyone who's been able to get the answer to this riddle. Okay, 20 years later, um, Tashma tells us, he happened to be in an event at Bar Ilan, and uh, Lieberman was there, and he got, got up the courage to say, you know, to ask him, can I ask you this question that um, Rav Gorin asked? And um, Rav Gorin said, okay, and uh, he asked him the question, and he says that for three minutes, there was quiet in the room. And uh, he says that it felt, you know, like a very long three minutes, uh, even though it was... Uh, uh, very short. At the end of the time, Lieberman gets up, he goes to the, pulls off from the bookshelf of Jerusalem Talmud, and points out exactly the answer to the question. And um, then he continues with the story that uh, later in the day, uh, he met Lieberman, and Lieberman said to him, um, um, you probably are wondering, you know, the, the, the few minutes it took, uh, what I was doing during that time. Um, and uh, he says as follows to him, um, had you asked me this question in my youth, I would have answered you immediately that there is no Jerusalem Talmud that says this. However, now that I'm older, I don't rely on my memory because my memory has become worse. Therefore, I've decided to go through in my head every page of the Jerusalem Talmud, starting from the beginning, in order to be sure that it didn't appear. And when I got to chapter two, if Tractate Sota, I found the place and I showed it to you. And Tashma says, 
myself, me and my wife, who already heard the, the story of, you know, the, about the riddle, we were shocked and we couldn't speak. In three minutes, he was, maybe it was five minutes, but he says three minutes, he was going through every page photographically in his mind until he got the Tractate Sota, that's the third order, Zorimo and Nashim. And, uh, and this is what Lieberman calls that his memory was not what it used to be. In fact, as he says, it was good as memory was not what it used to be because he wouldn't have remembered this. And this is what Lieberman, what uh, Tashma ends his recollection. He says, I have been worthy throughout the years to be a Ben Bayit, you know, literally to be close friends and live in the house as it were of many great Torah scholars and of the greatest of the Bikim, who have the greatest knowledge in our generation. He says, I have seen, Zachiti Lerot, Dugma Ot Kitsoniot, I have seen extreme examples of Bikiut and memory. And, and also from Lieberman, I saw this on other occasions. But such a happening, what he described of going through page after page, I never saw in my life, not before, not afterwards. And I'll never forget that, uh, that event. And I want to give you one more example of this. This is from another individual. His name is Shama Yehuda Friedman. Shama is an interesting Hebrew name, Tashma Shama. He's an American. And uh, I actually, when I lived on the Upper West Side, I, I knew his daughter. She was living on the Upper West Side at the time. He has a brother, Menachem, two geniuses. Uh, he's, he's the Chatan Pras Yisrael, uh, Shama Yehuda Friedman in Talmud. His brother, uh, not Menachem, um, I forget, somewhere, uh, yeah, yeah, not, not, not Menachem Friedman. Uh, Someone to help me out, uh, but, but uh, he, he's an expert in the in Revavram and Rambam. It is it's Menachem, I think. Yeah, Mordechai Friedman. Mordechai, Mordechai. Thank you very much, Mordechai Friedman. He's an expert in the in Revavram and Rambam. He's an expert in uh, Judeo Arabic uh, from the Geniza, a real chacham. And his brother Shama Friedman, he's uh, he maybe is the Talmud Mufak, the leading student of uh, Lieberman. You might say how Livni, but not, I wouldn't say so. We'll see how Livni already comes to Lieberman as an Eloi. He had studied in yeshivas and in Europe. Uh, you can read his memoir. I, I highly recommend everyone reading his memoir. In his memoir, he also has an example of Lieberman's unbelievable uh, attention to detail like we just read. But Shama Friedman never went to yeshiva. He became a, a Eloi and a gone in learning in his own measure. In fact, I know someone from Lakewood. He might be on listening to us now even. Uh, when he went to Israel, he told me he met with three people. He had come, he started becoming uh, knowledgeable in the more <laughs> academic world. He's also a huge Tamachacham, gives a Yomi. And he wanted to meet Halivni, he met, and he met them all, Halivni. And although Halivni today, unfortunately, I don't think you can really speak to, he's not well. Shama Friedman, and also uh, Shomo Zaman Havlin, if that name means anything. So Shama Yehuda Friedman, who's unbelievably prolific. I don't know how these people do it. Uh, when, I, when I say prolific, I mean long Hebrew articles. Almost all of his articles are in Hebrew. And uh, he's an expert in uh, academic study of Talmud. He says as follows. He, wrote, he also wrote an article in memory of, uh, of Lieberman. He, he teaches at Bar Ilan, or he, unless he's retired now. So he taught it at the seminary and then in Israel at the seminary and uh, there the branch and also at Bar Ilan. He says as follows. University. Yeah, at Bar Ilan. And then he says as follows. Uh, University. It, it's called uh, Comments in Memory of Shal Lieberman, Herot And uh, he says, this is page 95 in his essay. He says, I had a great sechut. I had a great, you know, Lieberman used to go every summer to Israel. And Friedman would pick him up and, uh, you know, at the airport and bring him back. He says, I had the great sechut, the great merit to be his balagola. You know, that's the, his, his wagon driver, as it were, in the car. Uh, he says, that's what Lieberman termed him. And especially when he went from Israel to Chutz Haaretz, that is from Jerusalem to New York, I would bring him to the, to the airport. We would leave, he would take the evening flight. So we'd leave uh, late at night. Uh, and uh, he says we would leave at around 10 p.m. at night when there's no cars on the road. Uh, he says Lieberman would speak to him for a few minutes when we were in the city. And as soon as we reached the highway, um, he was quiet. Um, and I wasn't sure why, whether he was learning in his mind, or he just wanted to rest or the thing. He says the last time I drove him, because um, 
what, the, when Lieberman flew to Eretz Yisrael, the last time he actually was Nifter, he passed away on the airplane. And I, I believe Usham Rafin was at the airport to get him. Uh, but uh, the last time I brought him back, um, he, the following happened. As we got close to the airport and we got off the highway, Lieberman asked me, what happened? We already came here? And, uh, and you know, what happened? He says, I, I, we already, we're here. And Lieberman said, it's impossible. We couldn't have gotten here already. And I explained that although we're not actually at the airport, we got off the highway, but uh, Lieberman was like, no, it's, it's not the time yet to get off the highway. Um, and then he said uh, to me, you drove faster than normal. And uh, Friedman says, it's true, I did. For whatever reason on that trip, I, uh, I, I wanted to get in there quicker than usual, and I drove faster. And uh, so how did Lieberman know this? I guess through their conversations, it became known to me that Lieberman would always would review on the trip from Jerusalem to the airport, the Mishnaya Seder Tarot, which is one of the hardest uh, sections of the Mishnah, the last section. And um, he would, through his review, he knew because each time he did it, that when he finished, let's say, up to this Mishnah, that would be the time uh, to get off. He knew exactly how long it would take. And therefore, when we reached, when we got off the highway, and let's say he'd only been up to Masechus Para or whatever he was, and uh, he usually would be up to, let's say, the last chapter, and he's only the first chapter, he knew that um, we had gone faster. So this is the mind of someone who, just in his mind, was going over everything like that. Incredible. Okay, with that short introduction, let us turn to uh, Rabbi Shaw, Professor Shaw Lieberman. First, I have to tell you that uh, although I'm going to be giving you a lot of stuff that I've discovered, that I knew, that I found, I also have to rely on people who've obviously gone before me, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, I highly recommend, if anyone's interested, this book, Saul Lieberman and the Man and His Work by uh, Elijah Shochet and Solomon Spiro, Solomon Spiro from Toronto, and Elijah Shochet. These are two um, close students of Lieberman. This was a labor of love, uh, the book they wrote. They, they do thank me in the preface. Uh, we acknowledge the contributions of Dr. Mark Spiro of the University of Scranton, who directed us to an important source of correspondence by Professor Lieberman. Um, so that was nice to see. But the, the basic biographical details you will find uh, done very nicely. They divide the book into his works, his life works, and his character. So this will be a very important uh, for the biography. Uh, and I'll be using this extensively. Uh, they begin the book, by the way, saying that we know very little about Lieberman's youth. He didn't speak about it. Uh, there is only one essay he wrote that deals with his youth, and that uh, is relevant to the Chazonish the famous Chazonish, who's his first cousin. Um, well, I'll tell you about this essay. Uh, it's called, um, they, they reprinted in the collected essays of Lieberman, Mech Karim Torah Teres Yisrael. This essay is called B'machitzat Rabbanim, among rabbis. And um, I'll be reading sections to you later where he speaks about his own youth. But for now, let me just tell you about uh, what he says about his cousin, the Chazonish. The Chazonish the great, certainly the greatest of the Haredi sages and one of the, of the second half of the 20th century, I think it's fair to say, the one who really created the Haredi response to the state of Israel, uh, an unbelievable Torah scholar, the Chazonish's mother and Lieberman's mother were sisters. Chazonish was significantly older than Lieberman. Uh, he, he, he begins by telling about this because, first of all, he comes from a village called Motol, M-O-T-O-L in Belarus. Uh, there are other people who come from there. Uh, in, uh, I was happy to see that um, uh, Shochat and Spiro mentioned, just to give you some of the people there, Azriel Shochat. He says, a historian who wrote about Jewish life in Eastern Europe. Professor Haifa, he was from there. Azriel Shochat, my favorite work, well, I have two favorite works from Israel Shochat. Uh, one is, I've mentioned this in this class a number of times, In Chu Fate Kufot, when I say in this class, in this series. Shochet writes about, um, he basically, he's wrong, uh, but he challenges the uh, perception of when modernity begins. Uh, he looks at uh, the sermons and the responsa, and he sees that there's already a breakdown in society 
really in the uh, the early 1800s, even the late um, 18th century, you know, rabbis rebuking people for mixed dancing and eating non-kosher when they went, uh, when I say non-kosher, you know, quasi-kosher, I should say. No one's eating pork, but they were, when they went to the fairs, they would maybe eat in inns, like, uh, you know, eating out. They ate fish out, let's say, things like that. Uh, and um, Shochet argues that we see already the breakdown of society, not like we usually think of in the end of the 18th century. Uh, the, the, and this is an argument, Shochet and Yaakov Katz. The problem is that Shochet's wrong for the simple reason, as Yaakov Katz points out, that you always had sinners. And you're always, the fact that you might have more sinners now than you had, let's say, 100 years before, doesn't change, is not fundamentally, there's no fundamentally ch fundamental change in society. These people who were going to the fairs and eating non-kosher, they knew that come Rosh Hashanah, they had to go to shul and repent. It, the, when you speak about modernity, a, a, new, a change, it's when you have a new outlook on life and you no longer feel bound to the old, um, the old models. You no longer feel bound to traditional norms. These people maybe were sinning more, but they still were part of a traditional society. If you put them in Cheyrem, it's not like they didn't care. They, they, they cared very much and they had to you know, repent because they too wanted, they might be a sinner, but they have to go to the shul. But why do I love this book, in Chilut Feit Kufot, so much? Because it gives you the other side. It's like a book of social history. So much of Jewish history is about the big people, the important people, the rabbis, but about the average people, the sinners, the, uh, the people who are going off the beaten track. I like to learn about them too, the average person. Um, I, I just picked up a book the other day by Ephraim Shoham Steiner. It's all, while I'm speaking to you, I'll pull it up for you. Uh, let me pull it up here if I can get it on Amazon. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know what it says about me that uh, I, um, I, um, what can I say? Here it is. I, um, let me pull it up for you here. I, I like this sort of stuff. Uh, maybe someone could do a, uh, a psychological portrait of me. This book just came out. Jews and crime in medieval Europe. I'm interested in that. Uh, I, I like the rabbis. We're gonna speak about rabbis, but what about the average person? What about uh, the women? And the, uh, the people who never became rabbis. And what about the criminals? You think crime was only invented, uh, murder incorporated or anything like that? No, we've had Jewish criminals. In the preface, he speaks about how Jewish scholars never wanted to write about this because it could lead to anti-Semitism and it's problematic. Uh, but yet there were Jewish criminals. I've spoken in the past uh, about uh, these gangs of uh, robbers in Germany who would live in the forests, and then they still would bring in a rabbi out when they had to get married. So uh, he's speaking about, that's, uh, that's in the 1500s or 1600s, he's speaking about earlier. You always had Jewish criminals, and you always had, um, <laughs> maybe they taught you in yeshiva that uh, in medieval times, everyone was a Talmud Chacham, and everyone showed up for davening, and uh, you know, it could be uh, Mincha Minyan on Wednesday. You'd have just as many people as Russian and Kipper. Don't believe it. Uh, I mean, maybe that's for Art Scroll, but it's, it's not for us. So, um, so that's why I like uh, Shochet's book. The other thing about his, the other book he wrote, he wrote a whole book about the crown rabbis, the Rav Mitam in Russia. The, you had uh, spiritual rabbis, and then you had every town uh, had a crown rabbi, one who had a, a secular degree, who was... Uh, recognized by the government, and basically just a functionary, unless you had someone like Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg, who had enough secular education that he could be both the crown rabbi for the government, doing all the stuff the government wants, and also the spiritual rabbi, the traditional rav. Most of the time, uh, you didn't have that. Communities would like to have that because it saves uh, money on, um, on salaries. Who else came from this city? Dov Yardane, a scholar of medieval Hebrew literature. Uh, as well as a couple others. Uh, he, uh, Lieberman, as I said, he, uh, we just, he comes from an important family. I'll read you some of the people he comes from, but just uh, his cousin is the Chazonish. And we're going to see later, there are letters in the letters of the Chazonish. None of the letters of the Chazonish have recipients, but I've been able to identify certain letters uh, as having been sent to Shaul Lieberman. 
And we'll see what the Chazonish was telling his cousin, because the Chazonish knew very well what Shaul Lieberman was doing at the Hebrew University. So uh, we, we, we shall get to that. And that's going to bring us into the whole issue of um, academic Talmud study and how Lieberman moves from uh, traditional rabbinic literature, traditional Talmud study, I should say, to a more academic approach. But that, that's coming. But in this essay, in speaking about, as I said, B'mchitzat Rabbanim, he he gives us insights into the Chazonish. And the people who write about the Chazonish, they have to deal with two sources that maybe they wouldn't deal with, but these are the only sources that give us insight into the Chazonish before he became the Chazonish. One is, of course, Chaim Grada. Chaim Grada, who was the great student of the Chazonish, and then leaves religion and becomes a great um, uh, Yiddish uh, novelist. So much so that Shaul Lieberman was very upset. He thought that Chaim Grada should have won the Nobel Prize, not Isaac Basheva Singer. He probably thought Isaac Basheva Singer was a manuvel, a, a lech, a lecherous writer or whatever. But um, uh, Chaim Grada, um, he comes to America, very important figure, never could meet the Chazunish. Didn't go to Israel until the Chazunish had passed away. And then he went to the Chazunish's grave. And he has a poem standing on the grave, his thoughts. But he didn't feel that he could go to, um, to be with the Chazonish. Um, why Chaim Grad? Uh, we spoke about him in the Chazonish classes. Uh, why he left religion. I know some people are cynical. Those old YU people, you might remember, uh, I forget which uh, professor it was, who spoke about subgartelian pressures. Um, some people have said that Chaim Grada, he just wanted to live a life, as you say, of Hafkeris, of uh, pleasure. That's why he left um, religion. But I, I don't know if that's the case or not. So they have to quote Chaim Grada. They yeah. pronounced it sub Gartelian. Gartelian. Okay, there you go. Uh, and then you have Shaul Lieberman in this essay reveal stuff about the Chazoni. So just quickly, I just tell you, because this relationship, what's what's so interesting about Lieberman, unlike other figures we'll mention, Ginsburg being the most prominent who we'll get into, is that Lieberman always remains a respecter of Torah sages, one who literally will sit in the, at the feet of great Torah scholars. He refers to the Briskarov and to Sefta Gishut as Maran. I mean, so Lieberman and, and, and always wanted to be with these Torah scholars. When he would go to Jerusalem, he would go with the Briskarov. When I say the Briskarov, we're talking about someone who was almost a Ture Karta, very extreme. And yet Lieberman would sit on his side right next to him. They were related sort of also, as you'll see. But uh, Lieberman was always, he wanted to be in that world. In America, he couldn't be. Because as we'll see, he cuts himself off when he goes to seminary. Privately, it could be, but not publicly. But in Israel, when he went there, he still could be a part of that great Torah society. So let me just read you quickly what he says about uh, the Chazonish. Unfortunately, no one interviewed him, as far as I know, um, other than this um, little article. He says, my relative, the Chazonish, he let, let, leaves his city and uh, where he lived, where his wife had a store, and he was living in Minsk. And this article is about Minsk. He says he lived in a street, and he, he gives us uh, the name of the street here, um, in a two room, small rooms next to the show. And if he says, if you look at his uh, clothes, the Chazonish's clothes and everything, the, 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 what the Chazonish uh, looks like, if you see him, um, you'd think that he was just a, <laughs> like a, a typical tailor. He didn't dress in rabbinic garb. And why should he dress in rabbinic garb? He's a balabas. He, he wasn't a rabbi. Uh, when I say he wasn't a rabbi, he was, didn't have a rabbinic position. Um, he's just a small, from a small town. When he this, Listen to this story. When the Chazunich first comes on a, um, on a Sunday yeah, in the afternoon to the synagogue, it was called Rav Isser's Shtibel, uh, other Jews were sitting there learning, and they had a shir in Talmud. And uh, the Chazunich, Rav Mishaya, um, he didn't see very well. So he took a Gemara and he was keeping it close to his eyes. And the people there who didn't know who he was, they thought that he was like uh, very strange. What is he looking for uh, in the Gemara? Uh, they, they didn't speak to him. They didn't say anything to him. But when other Balabatim came and they had to begin the Shir, they needed this, the Gemara that he had because that was the Gemara they were, they were learning. So uh, the Shamish came over to him and took the Gemara from him and said to him, 
Yehudi Pashut Sarech Omar A simple Jew shouldn't be looking at the Gemara, should be uh, reciting Tehillim. Remember, I said this in previous classes. They didn't have art scroll in those days. And even if they did have art scroll, the idea that simple Jews would do Daf Yomi not only wasn't part of the conception, and no one ever thought of it, but they wouldn't have thought it's appropriate. Who learns? Well, they didn't have Daf Yomi to begin with, but who learns Gemara? People went to yeshiva learn Gemara. If you know a little more, you can go to Hever in Yaakov. And then if you're a really simple person, you do Tehillim. The idea that you're going to bring in the, you know, the masses and teach them Talmud, that's an innovation of our time. It's been enormously successful, especially in the social context, because it's, it's really strengthened orthodoxy. As I've said in previous classes, though, is it smart from a pure you know, Torah learning standpoint? The Rav Yosef has said, no, if you only have an hour a day to learn, you should learn halacha. The problem is I don't think anyone's getting up at 6 a.m. to learn halacha. They want, uh, they want to feel like they're part of something bigger. And that's they learn Gemara. But they, they, they took the Gemara away from him and said, uh, you should be learning um, uh, Tehillim. And, uh, you know, this safer is not for you. We need the Gemara to learn it. And it's in the Lieberman says, the Chazonish didn't um, pay any mind to that. He nodded, gave him the book. And then the next day when he came uh, to the shul and uh, the Shamash came up to him and asked him to give him, to give him an aliyah. And he said his name, Avram Yishaya ben Rav Shemaryo, the Shamash who had heard of him. Some people had heard of this person. He was quite shocked. And uh, after he made the bracha, the Shamash came over to him very upset and asked him forgiveness. That he took the Gemara away from him. The Chazonish didn't understand what the, what the Shamash wanted. Uh, he thought the Shamash was right. The Gemara belongs to the Shul. The people there had a shear. Uh, they should give it to them. And that uh, a regular Jew like he is should uh, learn to him. Lieberman tells us in those years, he would sit in his house in Minsk. Remember, his wife is in their home city. He's by himself. He's like Gola to Makam Torah. He's exiled himself to Minsk, where he's not living with his wife. She sends him, let's say, money to, uh, so he can live. Uh, his wife would come only on Shabbos, and he would sit in the house and learn all day and all night. He, Lieberman tells us that sometimes a female relative would come and would need to stay with him. And because of the question of Yichud, being alone with a, uh, a woman, he would ask me, that is Lieberman, that I wish so I would stay with him on Shabbos. Uh, and I slept in his house. Uh, he says, Lieberman says, one night when I got up from my sleep, um, I saw him sitting next to his bed, the yarmulke on his head. Uh, he had not lit in a, a candle. I guess not to wake up Lieberman, and he was learning Baal Peh, uh, Tractate Erevin. And Lieberman says, I think those were the best days for him, because most people did not know who he was, and he was able to be by himself and learn. No one bothered him. His wife would send him things, he, whatever he needed. He survived on very little. Um, he didn't have any connection to any yeshiva. He didn't teach anyone. He just sat and he learned, and I was a Ben Bayit. I, Shal Lieberman, would, would be with him all because I was his relative. And, uh, and then he goes on and um, how he, after, then he talked about how he then moves to uh, um, uh, Vilna. He tells an interesting story that once uh, robbers came in, they, they, they slept like behind the store. Uh, they came into the store and uh, he says that uh, the Chazunich heard the robbers in there, but didn't uh, make a noise or raise his voice because he thought maybe they would kill him. So he made believe like he was sleeping. And in the morning, when he saw that he had nothing left in the store, he says, oh, now there's no problem. We can go to Eretz Yisrael. And they went to Eretz Yisrael because his wife, she, he wanted to go to Israel, Lieberman tells us, and his wife didn't, um, Chazunich's wife, because she said, I have a store. But when they lost all their stuff, then um, it was time to go to Israel. Um, by the way, these would have been <laughs> presumably in Vilna, which was a, was a 40%, 50% Jewish. These would have been probably Jewish robbers uh, in Vilna. And then he continues, Lieberman, talking about his learning in Sabadka, all the things we're going to speak about. Uh, um, let me say two more things. Next class, I just want to say that just to give you some of the yichos of Lieberman, uh, I told you I'd stop at 15 after, because I do want to answer some questions. Um, what we're going to see next class, obviously, the yeshivas he was at, everyone knows he was at Sabatka, but he was at a different yeshiva, more than one different yeshiva as well. But uh, just to give you some examples of his uh, the lineage, um, on his mother's side, well, first I have the relationship to the Chazanish, but Rashal Katzenelenbogen, um, who, and the father of Shal Katzenelenbogen, uh, um, was Rameer Halevi Epstein, based in Vilna, 
descended from Arya Leib, Chief Rabbi of Konigsberg. Uh, his father side, he was descended from the, the author of the Sefer Karen Ora. That's a very in, important work. And they give some others uh, examples that uh, the, the Divrei Malkiel, Malkiel C. Tenenbaum was the uncle of his father. He comes out of the rabbinic elites, as do so many of these great, and Ginsburg also, descended from the brother of the Vilna Gaon. Shmuel Atlas, another figure we'll speak about. I can't tell you how many people say that he is the uh, son of um, uh, Rav Meir Atlas, the Rav of Shavli, which would have made him the brother-in-law of Rav Hanan Wasserman. They do that because um, Nelson Kamenetsky in his book, Making of a Godel, says this. But it's wrong. It's completely wrong. All you have to do is open up uh, Atlas's um, commentary, the edition of the commentary of the Riva at Above Kami. You see who his father was. Uh, I guess he's probably a cousin or something. Atlas was an important rabbinic family, but uh, he doesn't come from that yichus. Okay, my friends, uh, I usually start uh, at the beginning of uh, the Get, deal with the questions the previous week. But I'm going to do it now at the end because we had 53 classes and uh, we had some comments, some questions. So let me quickly get to the few things I want to show you and then I'll get to the questions. First of all, we spoke in previous classes. I spoke about Jerba. I spoke about the old way of doing things when you didn't have hashkachas, that you come to a town. If someone's a pious Jew, you can eat at his house. You can buy food from his store, all that sort of thing. And, uh, and Someone emailed me that um, this would never be accepted today. And yeah, in America, it wouldn't be. But I'm going to tell you people something. And uh, people come on the trips with us to Europe. They're shocked by this. But I, everywhere you go in the world, you still have kosher restaurants with no hashkacha that everyone eats in. I just returned from Greece. Rhodes and... Um, Athens, uh, right, restaurants there, I've done all over the world. Chabad restaurants. And all over the world, you have Chabad restaurants. And everyone eats there. You know, the Litvish eat there, the Hasidi meat there, everyone eats there. These restaurants are for profit. They're, in other words, the money made on these restaurants is to uh, support not just the, the Chabad uh, programming, it supports the rabbi and the family who's living there. None of these Chabad restaurants have hashkachas at all. Sometimes they have a tuda, but the tuda is signed by the rabbi who owns it, who's the Chabad shliach. So I know people find it strange when you say that you can go to restaurants that don't have hashkacha, but all these Chabad restaurants, none of them, the idea of hashkacha is that some outsider. So why do we eat there? We all eat there. I ate there. I ate there in Rhodes over Shabbos. We had Friday night 200 less Shabbos. Well, not two days, uh, not two days ago, but the week before, two hundred people, almost everyone from Israel, in Rhodes um, Friday night. Uh, Shabbos lunch was about a hundred, so it's a little less. Uh, but uh, everyone's eating there. We had a whole group of Sephardic yeshiva students, and um, because you trust the uh, you trust the rabbi, you trust the Chabad rabbi, and that's the halacha. Uh, the Aruch Hashulchan wants to say that if you make money on it, uh, then uh, you should have a shkacha, but I think he's only referring to like if you have a store and you sell things, but even the Chabad, you buy things from them. So the fact is that even though your local rabbi is going to tell you it's impossible to eat in a restaurant if it doesn't have a shkacha, I tell you that in America that could be the case. And even if your local rabbi opened up a restaurant, you'd have to probably have to get the Vad to do it. When you leave America, you find everywhere you go the Chabad restaurants, and they do not have uh, hashkacha other than hashkacha. You're relying on the local rabbi. So uh, thank you for that person who sent me that. Well, about four or five of you told me I'm a prophet. I'm not a prophet. Why am I a prophet? Remember the last class? I told you all about how I won't eat Ben and Jerry's. I told you how bad this company is. And all of you never heard of this. You all thought, what am I talking about? One week after I... Um, went into my whole spiel about uh, Ben and Jerry's and how only on a shas of chak you can eat it. We all know what happened. It's not, but again, this is no news. I was telling you this before that this is what the company is about. And there's a woman who's in charge of this. She has posted such anti-Israel, even anti-Semitic type stuff. So uh, I'm not a prophet. And the only shock is that other than me, basically none of you, no one else knew what Ben and Jerry's is all about. Now it's a big finish. The Ben and Jerry's does this. It's the same Ben and Jerry's as it was 
four weeks ago when I told you about Ben and Jerry's. They've always been anti-Israel. They've always been anti-Semitic in that sense. They've always been anti-American, anti-cop, whatever. They, they're the same Ben and Jerry's. Uh, so I'm not a prophet. Uh, prophecy was taken away and given to fools, but maybe I'm a chacham because uh, I looked into this Ben and Jerry's already three years ago. Now my problem is next time we're in Greece, if we can't get the uh, Hagen das I'm going to serve Ben and Jerry's because you heard my psak where I said that if there's nothing else, you can eat Ben and Jerry's. We rely on the note of Yehuda. It's a uh, shasat chak. You're traveling. I'm going to have all my American travelers and they're going to say we can't eat Ben and Jerry's. So uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and finally, the last thing I want to say before I get to the comments, uh, many of you, especially in the Haredi world, we have many people, some with us live and many who listen uh, and watch it later, they found it very interesting about the songs, the singing I showed you from the, you know, just in the modern Orthodox world and uh, boys and girls singing together. So I want to show you just one more thing, which uh, those of us in the modern Orthodox community, well, in the New York area, I should say, won't find this surprising. Those in the Haredi world, again, you will, but uh, I think you'll find it uh, of interest. It's from Moshava Tishabov. I'm going to play you this a uh, minute, two minutes. They did a very nice thing, I'm told by my son, who is the counselor there, that between the parochim in Eicha, they would have uh, skits and things to keep it relevant uh, for uh, the kids. And between one of the uh, chapters, this is what they did. And here you have, and this, I, I know for the Haredi world who are with us, you find this completely shocking and just impossible, but this is, this is standard. And uh, let me... Um, get it for you and I'll play so you see, um, hold on a second, let me get my screen here. This, you could add this to the list of the other things that I showed you that uh, people found. So I got the sound on. And this was uh, Tisha Bov, boys and girls. Hold on, I got to get the sound here. It's not uh, working, the sound. Uh, let me just get it here. Hold on. I'm going to have to open it up again uh, because it didn't, um, I left it open so long that, um, let me, um, let me open it up again uh, for you. Um, um, so you can see this. Um, Let's see. Um, I'm saying this, I'm doing this mostly for the, the Haredi people who are with us, so you can see. Okay. So for those who uh, found it, uh, as I said, very strange that uh, this is like typical, you know, uh, in the modern Orthodox world. I, I know I got emails from people in the Haredi world, and not just in the Haredi world, even more of these more right-wing modern Orthodox, uh, but uh, this is, I just showed you was Tish above. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I, I previously showed you the, the rock concert, but I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's normal in uh, the circles, uh, Mosheva type uh, circles. So with that, uh, we've only, as the song says, we've only just begun. 
Uh, we haven't even really, uh, he hasn't almost, he hasn't even been born yet, the Lieberman. So we have a lot to do, lots of great stuff uh, coming next week. We'll move into the yeshiva world. Uh, where he gets his early education, the Gadol Yisrael, uh, Rav Kook. Rav Kook will make an appearance even before we get to Eretz Yisrael, as you shall see uh, uh, next class. But um, let me now go to the questions and uh, see uh, what I do is I read the questions out loud it's for the people who listen online. Um, yes, iPad says, Gadol is the ones who create or attract the most fervent followers. That, that is true. Baruch says, who is a greater Torah scholar than the Tziv or Chaim Brisker? I don't think you can, uh, the Nitziv knew stuff that the Rav Chaim Brisker did not know. The Nitziv, uh, who, the Nitziv was unique. He, who else wrote about Halachic Midrash? Wrote a commentary on the Chumash like he did and uh, wrote on the Shiltos. On the other hand, Rav Chaim, in terms of analysis, uh, was also unique. So I don't think you could say one or the other is a greater Torah scholar. Uh, in terms of influence, obviously Rav Chaim Brisker, had a uh, greater influence. And uh, in terms of genius, they will tell you that Rafael Brisker was greater. But uh, in terms of influence, um, um, Lieberman was more influenced by the Nitziv. No question about that. Uh, um, yes, and Yochevet says, in the case of Sinai Oser uh, Harry, uh, Okar Hari. Rabbi Shudnow says, I thought Garash was go. Oh, not going. Yes, Garash is gone. Hagon Rav Shaul. But uh, usually Gon and Gadol are used uh, synonymously uh, um, when you deal with great figures. Um, I don't have a Gadol measuring yardstick, but uh, you don't really need a Gaonus. You can need a yardstick, Baruch. But you can look, you can see if a rabbi has great influence. If, if a rabbi has many followers, then you, he's a Gadol. He might not be as great as someone else. That's the hard thing, is to determine who's a greater Torah scholar. Uh, and maybe we shouldn't even be interested in that, but sometimes it's obvious. Uh, but a Gadol, you can look at their, their influence. See, a Gadol is not just someone who's, uh, is someone who has an influence as well. That's what I think the term means. Yeah, when Bill Gewirtz says Gadol Edor also means lay leaders. In the Talmud, as we saw, you, you said this before we got to it, uh, uh, no doubt. Uh, in the Tal Talmud, that's what it's referring to. Uh, what's the daughter of a god to look for in a spouse? Well, he's supposed to be a Talmud Chacham, so she should look for a Talmud Chacham uh, also. But as we saw last semester, she shouldn't look too hard. We saw last the last class, or the second to last class, we heard this very sad story of a woman who never married, remained an old maid, because her father, who was a great rabbi, taught her so much Torah that she would only marry someone if the man knew more than her or at least knew as much as she did. And since she was so learned, it was very hard to her to find it. So uh, um, at least in pre-modern times, they might say, <laughs> don't, don't, uh, don't look too high. Um, um, Rabbi Kelman says that he has the good fortune of having Cheryl Toshma as a teacher. Wow, I don't know where you'd have a teacher. Where would he be your teacher? He didn't teach at Beit Gross. Ah, no, when I was in Beit Morisha for the year, you know, Benny Shalom, I had, that's when I had Danny Sperber for the year, 93, 94. And Yisrael Tashma taught there. He knows everything. Like a, yeah. He's like a Schneer Lyman type. He knows yeah. everything about everything. And, uh, you know, I have all his books, and he was really an uh, unbelievable and, column. And he, he, before he started teaching, he worked in the Institute for Manuscripts. So yeah, he, he worked knew, at Hebrew University. He ran oh, the manu, yes. the, the mini, right, that I uh, worked there. He, he, he had his... Book, somebody he, mentioned the Harvard book in English with about yes. 20 articles in English. But uh, he did write mainly Hebrew. He's not so famous in America, but... Uh, he was really something unbelievable. Somebody not only is he not famous, I remember someone showed me, I think it might have been Seth Harbour, the Jewish observer once. So they, for whatever, they uh, they quoted something. Israel was talking about something about rabbis, and they quoted Professor Tashma. And the person, the Jewish observer, obviously I'd never heard of Tashma, and he said, a certain individual, something like that, named Tashma. And as Rabbi Farber mentioned to me, I mean, uh, Tashma could be a Rosh Hashiva anywhere, and, uh, but they'd never heard of him. So it's only, it's like we spoke last semester when the Atayd Neman mocked the Yad David, uh, David Sinsheim, because of the way he looked without knowing who he was. So uh, uh, William Gewirtz says that Chaim Salvatia treated Tashma with great respect. Well, they, they disagreed. They, uh, they disagreed on certain basic issues, but how could you not treat Tashma with uh, respect. Um, Mel says, oh, for those who don't know, Dr. Grach, that's, that's a little inside the baseball. Uh, 
Uh, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, if you look at the Navale, the, the, the of Reb Chaim Soloveitchik on the Rambam, he's called the Grach, the Gon Reb Chaim. So as a joke, uh, they refer to the Chaim Soloveitchik, the professor Chaim Soloveitchik, uh, his students, I don't know how many years ago, they started calling him Dr. Grach. Um, if you look in Lairhouse today, there's an article by Moshe Shoshan dealing with Chaim Soloveitchik and his father, because Rabbi Soloveitchik has these, this video in which he comes out against the academic study of Judaism. So Shoshan's asking, what about his son? His son, well, uh, what, what, I mean, I, I want to phrase it the way Shoshan does that. Uh, did he think his son, Dr. Grach, was a heretic? No, it's not. It's, uh, but, um, and also Shoshan joins together Tversky and Soloveitchik. It's not true in the, because Tversky never dealt with the history of Halakha. But it is the case that uh, everything the Rav speaks against in these talks, historicizing halacha, that's exactly what his son, Dr. Grach, does. And the answer to this is, uh, at the end of the day, uh, although he was an enormous Talmud Chacham, he came under the influence of uh, Jacob Katz and Ephraim Morbach and others. And uh, that's, uh, I don't know if I'd go so far as Aaron Rekefet, who says that Jacob Katz was more influential on Chaim Soloveitchik than his own father, but uh, there's no question that, um, that uh, the historical approach to the study of halacha, unless Rabbi Soloveitchik would distinguish between Talmud and medieval halacha, because Dr. Grach only deals with medieval halacha. He historicizes it, no question about it, but he doesn't do it in the Talmudic period. And uh, maybe uh, there's a distinction um, uh, distinction there. Uh, I don't know. Um, someone privately texts me that Shama Friedman was uh, his teacher. Uh, Bill Gewertz says the year there of Lichtenstein won the Israel Prize for Jewish literature. Shama Prize won. Shama Friedman won the Israel Prize uh, for Talmud. I remember. At, I was in Israel. I think when it was announced, because people thought that it should have been given to Halivni. They, but Halivni was not living in Israel. And as it was explained to me, they figured that Shama Friedman, um, he, he was living in Israel for all those years, he should get it first. But then um, Halivni uh, did get it. Someone else made a comment to me. I don't have it here. In my Lieberman booklet, in the Hebrew section, I refer to Halivni. He was quite helpful to me as the, the, the greatest of the students of Lieberman. Um, and someone says, well, maybe uh, I should, you know, what about Shama Friedman? I think when I when I said the greatest of the students, I think I meant uh, you know the greatest Talmudist who was a student of Lieberman, not the greatest student that is the one whose Halivni's method of Talmud study is completely different than Lieberman. But uh, Shama Friedman would acknowledge that uh, Halivni is 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 above him, and I think. Uh, but okay, um, thank you, Mel, for uh, explaining the acronyms. Naftali uh, Lort says, oh, the, the, the Tashma article is in English, which was just mentioned by Rabbi Kelman. Yes. A recent, Bill Gortz, a recent article Dan Biarin on Lieberman was overwhelming. It, 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 was, it was in Talmud. Indeed, it was in Talmud. And I will get back to that article later on Boyarin, the complicated Boyarin, who we mentioned as well. And the Terry Carta, BDS supporting Boyarin, who happens to be a great, great scholar. We spoke about him in the last semester. Uh, he is also a Talmud Mufak of Lieberman, and he's someone who comes to the, sem to the seminary. I'm not going to say he's like Christine Hayes, but uh, not far removed. He came from the seminary with like a typical conservative type background, uh, and he becomes uh, an Eloy in Talmud uh, under the um, auspices, I guess, say the tutelage. He's, he's Christine Hayes' uh, PhD uh, advisor. Yes, he was. But I mentioned Christine Hayes. They're very Christine different Hayes had people. no Hebrew at all right. until she wasn't, I think, till the middle of college. So uh, these are just geniuses, uh, these people who uh, could come late to it. Uh, um, yeah, there it is. Thank you. Um, Rabbi should now. Um, he, he, Lieberman is a student of Lieberman. He mentioned to me that he was from Moto. And then in Chicago, where I come from, there's a Matala show. Ah, very nice. Um, Rabbi Shunna says he didn't accept the concept of an heir of Manhattan. He wore his handkerchief. Later on, we'll speak about some of his uh, piety. But for the opponents, that's not going to be enough. Because there's a famous story that's uh, told, Rabbi Schwab actually tells it in one of his books, that Zachariah Frankel, 
We're going to deal with Zachariah Frankel. Zachariah Frankel has many similarities to Lieberman, but Zachariah Frankel, who taught in Breslau, which is really the, um, you know, the predecessor of, it was even called Jewish Theological Seminary, but in many ways, it's the predecessor of the early JTS in America. He was so observant that there was, once they were at one of these resorts, and he refused to carry, even though the Orthodox, quote, Rabboni, the old time Rabboni, they were all carrying. And Rabbi Schwab gives us as an example that, you know, uh, just because you're pious, you can still be a heretic sort of thing. But uh, the piety of Lieberman, no one's going to question, just like uh, Frankel. My own position, I, Frankel, Rabbi Chayak of Weinberg had a lot of respect for Frankel. Franco was a genius of geniuses, and you could very easily, Franco would fit in very well, not just at bar Ilan, obviously at bar Ilan University, but at Bernard Revel Graduate School for YU, Franco, uh, Franco would be more conservative than some of the other people they've had, like Zeitlin and, uh, and Feldblum and others at uh, Bernard Revel. Franco was a, well, I consider him a, a, a traditional uh, Jew, even no Hirsch. Rav Shamshon, Rafal Hirsch, was very opposed to him. Rabbi Weinberg writes in one place that, uh, well, he, he thinks that uh, this Rabbi Hirsch uh, went overboard against him. Barry says that from Chai Grada, you get a great appreciation for the Chazunish. I heard from Professor Torsky that the best image of the Chazunish comes from Chaim Grada. If you haven't, they haven't reprinted uh, the, his book, the Yeshiva, they reprinted some of his e essays, but um, not just the Chazonish of what it meant to be a Musser personality in the Musser world. Uh, Chaim Grada, look, I've read Isaac Basheva Singer too. It doesn't really grab me like, like Chaim Grada. Chaim Grada, it's, uh, it's great stuff. And in the Haredi world, they love Chaim Grada. You can go on the Otsar Chachma forum. There's a whole forum devoted to Chaim Grada. They might not be able to announce it publicly and speak it, but uh, everyone knows that Chaim Grada gives... And this is the guy who... Uh, became so irreligious later. Uh, Barak says, I'm lumping together all modern Orthodox. When in reality, it's quite diverse, not monolithic category. I don't remember Baruch where I lumped together all modern Orthodox. Modern Orthodox goes from everything to uh, the eating fish out uh, sort of thing. Uh, uh, what, what's the expression? Um, live pagan and Talk Jewish, live pagan. I forgot the expression. I can't remember it. You have the modern Orthodox community is full of uh, pagans. Uh, that is, they put they put tefillin on, if they, not all of them do, but they put tefillin on in the morning and the rest of their life is pagan. But you had that in Germany also. Isaac Breuer speaks about that. He says, realistically, <laughs> what was more important to us? You know, secular culture, for he's talking about most German Jews, or uh, Torah. So you have that. And then you go to places, you can go to places like Teaneck, where you have... Uh, you know, serious, uh, just as, you know, people who are Kovea Iti Motora and everything in the middle. The modern orthodoxy is a very, very large tent. So I've, I've, I've certainly never uh, uh, lumped them uh, together. Um, now you say about God was the relation of Shmuel Arbach, Rebbe and Steinman. I say this because everyone I've spoken to, and these are people who are on Rav Steinman's side, say that Shmuel Arbach was a gon, a real gon in learning. And Rav Steinman was not at that level. Rav Kanievsky, of course, no one knows more than him. And he lined up behind Rabbi Steinman. But there seems to be general acknowledgement, just like there'd be general acknowledgement that the Rogachover, for instance, is greater than lots of other rabbis who are more important than him in terms of influence. Uh, I, it's not for me to judge. Obviously, they're all great, great Torah scholars. But I'm saying if you go into a place like Lakewood, and I heard this dafka from someone from Lakewood that, uh, the, the, you know, the hawk in the Lakewood uh, is that there's no question. There are Shmuel Arbach is a gon shabagonim. He was. And, um, ah, okay. Thank you for someone telling me about the obsolete and the, um, the offensive epithet old mate. Okay, I will not use that again. Uh, yes, and Professor Toshma Natali is the founder of the periodical Ale Sefer which I have one little piece in there, I discovered in East Germany, when it was still East Germany, the doctoral dissertation of a real Hildesheimer, which to this day has never been published because it's in Latin. And they have a hard time, I don't read Latin, but the last page of it is in Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, Curriculum Vitae. So I published the Curriculum Vitae, his, his, his autobiography in uh, Ale Sefer, but I have copies of it and other people have copies. Uh, of uh, this doctoral dissertation of Israel Hildesheimer on the Septuagint. Uh, 
Yes, and Baruch, that's the, the singing, the Kolisha is the, the camp video. I just wanted to show that. So uh, thank you all. Um, we are just getting started, and uh, I look forward to next week when we really have a chance to, to really get into it. Send me your comments, uh, your questions, your criticisms, and uh, I'm glad to be back and to see you all. And Rabbi should now holding up Hellenism in Jewish Palestine. We shall, uh, we shall, we shall arrive there definitely. Okay, Thank Rabbi Kelman. Thank you very much. Uh, your story about Shaul Lieberman going through the Yerushalmi in three minutes reminds you the story um, and the Chama Leibowitz told us. She once asked Rav Herzog, the first you know, chief rabbi of Israel, of course, the grandfather of the current president, um, Isaac Halevi Herzog. She asked him a question, the Chama told us, and Rav Herzog went like this. The Babli is alone in Tzah. It's not in the Babylonian. And then the Chama told us but he, Rav Herzog told her he can't do that in the Yerushalmi. He can only do that in the Bapli. So here you are saying, you know, Shel Lieberman going through the Yerushalmi in the three well, minutes. They have these people, you know. Well, they were the they were the closest of friends, as we'll see, Rav Herzog and Shel Lieberman. And um, and also the son of Rav Herzog, uh, Yaakov Herzog. By the way, if anyone... Who was the ambassador to Canada, as you know. But if anyone... I discovered years ago the transcript of a conversation of Yaakov Herzog of Weimar. I wrote about it. Then someone got a hold of it on, when they published it, the Israel State Archives. They put, they're putting stuff online. So now it's, it's out there for anyone to see. They just put on YouTube. This is the first time, for me, it's a simcha. The first time I ever heard the voice of Rabbi Chiyak of Weimar. He's now on YouTube. The problem is my Yiddish is not so good. But if anyone knows Yiddish, you have a two hour conversation from 1965 of Rabbi of Weinberg and Yaakov Herzog, and some of the stuff in there, let's just say it's not going to appear in an art scroll uh, uh, biography, but it, it's right there, and uh, it's because Yaakov Herzog in 1965 went to Rabbi of Weinberg, and uh, it's great stuff, but I do have the transcript, so I know every, it's a transcript in Yiddish, I can read Yiddish, to understand it, it's uh, it's a bit more of a problem. So I can send that to anyone who's interested in that as well. And these are all names for by Herzog, others that we're going to we're going to get deep into. So um, thank that you YouTube all. is under uh, Weinberg or under Herzog. Actually, it, they made a mistake. I told them they they write H Yaakov H E T Z O G. But if you plug in Yaakov Weinberg in Hebrew, you also it'll also come up uh, and. Uh, Okay, thank you all. Thank you, a pleasure. We look forward to next week. And next class, we're still, you know, two more classes in our new series of to our ongoing classes. Wednesday morning at 11 a.m., Benny Gesundheit is going to start a four-part series on the Machzor. Tvila Chana, you know, creative and uh, fascinating. If we did our 30-part safe before we went to Hillam with him. And Thursday morning, Ari Shvat begins a five-part series on a Rot HaTshuva of Rav Kook. And we have our regular ongoing classes, Yirmiyahu and the Haftor of the Week and the Parsha of the Week this week will be given by Yaakov, Yaakov Yaffe of Maimonides, um, where the Rav served as the rabbi now. He's the rabbi there, uh, Rabbi Jaffe, and uh, Maishir Perkei Avod on uh, Friday morning. And then next Sunday, we start Natty Helfgott will begin his series on Sefer Yonah. And uh, Daniel Ron Reinhold will begin on Chuba. We have a whole bunch of uh, series. I'm sure you all got the email. If you're not, take a look. And uh, you can register. And we look forward to learning with you. And thank you very much. And thank you again, Dr. Mark. A pleasure to have you back. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody soon. And like I always say, invite your friends. Let them know of uh, the wonderful le learning opportunities that we have. And uh, we look forward to learning with you and, uh, and your friends. Thank you, everybody. Lila Tov.